What I'm going to be talking about today um, is um, some work which um, hasn't been done under the under the auspices of the centre, but um, um, I am a funder. Um, I am associated with the centre, and, and I guess it really reflects a lot of, about um, what we're about, which is about translation and, and policy makers working together with researchers. Um, so I've always felt I've had a bit of a foot in both camps um, in this centre and, and through my career. Um, one of the great things about working for ACT Health is we have very generous um, study leave allowance. And so this, uh, the, the talk I'm giving today is a, it's about a study I've, I've embarked upon with no funding uh, from the centre or elsewhere, only my study allowance from, from ACT Health. Um, uh, so, building coalitions of the willing, and I think we've had a lot of talk about that, the coalitions of the willing, and I'll, I'll touch on the coalitions of the unwilling as well at some point. I did, did raise this in my talks with uh, people and colleagues in New York. Um, I thought it was really weird because I'm mostly Democrat voters and you know, here I am, sort of, you know, George Bush-isms. Um, but you, you, hopefully you'll, you'll agree with me that it's a useful way of thinking of it. Um, Um, so the talk outline, um, obesity, what's, what's all the fuss? So when I've given this talk before, I've had to make that argument, but I, I will make it again briefly at the beginning just because um, it's a policymaker's perspective uh, and some, some things that, which we touched on a bit in the, in the talks earlier today about what that is. Yep. Um, so I'll, I'll spend a couple of slides doing that. Uh, then talk about a, 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 a colleague I worked with up in Darwin had this theory that you only get funding for, for research if you have a catchy title, so, uh, which is an acronym. So I've got, this is actually half of the copy canny study. It's comparing obesity prevention initiatives in Canberra and New York. Uh, this is the New York bit. Um, so I'll be talking about the New York uh, study, some of the preliminary analysis I've done. I've, I've written a report for the, for the Department of Health, uh, which is... Uh, which is with them now, um, and, uh, and working on some papers related to that, so some initial thoughts about that. And I'll finally come back to this idea of coalitions of the willing, and particularly um, research translation and the academic policy maker interface, and how, how that might work. Uh, it kind of touches on some of the things that we talked about, how the centre could progress in the next few years. Um, so I'll spend some time on that at the end. Um, uh, when I was a PhD student with Lucy, I was uh, uh, studying TB, um, it has exactly, virtually exactly the opposite graph to this. <laughs> um, so tuberculosis is mainly an issue in, in developing countries, mainly in the tropics. Um, obesity, mainly an issue in non-developing, in developed and rich countries, not in the tropics. Um, but as has been put uh, in a previous slide with the burden of disease studies, that, that's changing rapidly. So uh, South Africa is a, is a, a case in point. Um, rapidly developing country, rapidly developing an obesity issue. Um, some of the places in the Pacific um, still have a TB burden, but, but um, uh, Nauru, for example, the, the fattest country on earth. Um, so it's everywhere, it's prevalent, and I don't need to convince this audience of the problem. Uh, here's a graph from a, a, a previous funder of the centre, now no longer with us, unfortunately, um, uh, from their report on, on state of health um, in, in Australia from a couple of years ago. Um, I spend a lot of time when I'm talking to, um, to health groups and non-health groups in the ACT about what the obesity problem is. Everyone wants to focus on uh, this end of the graph here, um, and, and that's, that's the, the idea that that is obesity. So if you can't see it, oh, it's behind that. This it's the bit behind the chair. Um, uh, so, so very grossly obese. And I think there's, there's a couple of stories to, to tell there. One is, um, yes, they are a problem. Secondly, they're in your face in terms of health service providers in particular. Um, um, but it, it, uh, it hides the population issue um, that, that I'm trying to deal with in the ACT, and I think most people in this room are trying to deal with at a population level. It's really that grey area, the change in obesity prevalence and overweight pre prevalence. And particularly, it's about delaying that shift from overweight to obesity over time. Uh, because for every year we can do that, um, we're going to save, save, save money. Speaking of money, um, this is the slide that gets everyone's attention. Um, and it's why I'm, I'm so, I think some of the really strong things that are coming out of the centre already and will do in the future are the economic arguments. Um, and I think the discussion we had earlier uh, today about how you fit uh, economics into uh, a, a systems paradigm will be really fascinating to see how that process develops. Um, Treasuries get this graph. Uh, they, they can see it happening 
so this is South Australian data essentially saying that within a very short period, if nothing changes in terms of what we spend on, on chronic diseases, mostly that's what's driving the, the health spend in, at the state level, because it's about hospitals, um, uh, then the entire state budget, wherever we are, whether it's Victoria, or if it's New South Wales, if it's nationally, if it's uh, ACT, it's a similar, it may be a different year, but it's, it's a similar, similar point, uh, that will be the entire spend of state governments very soon. Uh, so, there are choices. We either spend less, unlikely, um, we do something about prevention, possibly, um, or we look at different ways of doing things. Um, we may even raise taxes, that would be an interesting thing, but um, uh, we'll watch that space. Um, now, I went to the World Cup last year, um, in, in the World Cup soccer in Brazil. Um, anyone who's a follower of soccer would, would recognise this tackle. Um, it was uh, it was uh, it changed the changed the course of the semi final. Um, Holland lost uh, basically because of a well timed tackle just outside the penalty area, which led not to a penalty but a stopping of an almost certain goal, and they went through to the final. Um, for those of you that have no interest in soccer, you won't know what I'm talking about. But um, <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make here is um, I uh, and if you take take uh, there's about two key messages from this talk. One of them is that I think a lot of this is about timing. Um, and so I reflected when I was preparing this talk and previous ones about, about the, the well-timed challenge uh, that happened when I first started uh, as a, a Chief Health Officer in the ACT. The first one was um, the, the then Health Minister who, who rapidly also became the Chief Minister, another timing element. Um, so running the government and running health said, what is the government doing about the result of this, of the, the, key, the key finding of the Chief Health Officer's report in ACT in 2010? Which was about obesity prevalence increasing, um, and, um, and 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 sort of an exponential rise in a sense over, over a number of years. Um, so that was the first thing. I had a had a, a, a political um, uh, imprimatur to do something, uh, a challenge to do to for the chief health officer to lead that, um, and through that a whole range of conversations started. That was the that was the first well timed. Uh, uh, tackle component. Um, the second one was a PhD student came and saw me from NSEF, and uh, Sharon's not here now, but um, uh, she came and said, what are you policy people doing? You, you, you know, you've spent so much time on smoking, um, and you know just as much about obesity, and you're doing bugger all. Uh, I said, yeah, that's true. Um, and, and he said, you're, people are going to point the finger at you in 20 years' time and say, why didn't you do anything about obesity? So, uh, so I did. <laughs> um, I said, right, okay, well, we'll move on. Um, so, about three and a half years later, <laughs> we came up with a plan. So, uh, um, uh, which is uh, an, another whole story I'm not going to tell today, but maybe I'll get another, another chance to tell that about how we came up with our zero growth plan for the ACT. Um, by not throwing away the data, but by including that. Um, and uh, in here is a, a, a 19 point plan across six, six different uh, spheres led by four different directorates within the ACT government, uh, coordinated at an essential central place uh, to do stuff um, at the population level about obesity prevention. Um, and it's kind of happening. It's, got a, it's, it's funded. Uh, it's, it's working to an extent. Um, um, it's got its issues, um, but um, uh, it's there. So um, about, the other, about, the other, uh, about the time when this was launched, uh, Karen Lee, that some people may know from, from um, uh, New York came and visited, um, and I gave her a copy of the of the policy, and she said, "Gee, you guys are doing a lot of stuff similar to New York. You should come to New York and see what we did." Um, so again, well timed because I thought, right, that sounds like a great idea. So, uh, so I did last year and spent spent some time there, and that was that was where the copy canny idea came from. That that well timed event, um, and I'm going to talk about the New York um, side of things um, this time. Um, Essentially, um, uh, yeah, I'll move, move on to the New York, New York aspect. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of similarities. Um, you'll, you'll see them um, as I go through. There were a lot of differences as well between New York and, and Canberra. But, but the idea was really to look at two quite contrasting places with a similar problem, um, uh, a, in some senses a similar approach to the problem from a policy perspective, um, uh, and to see what were, the, what were the elements that were similar and, 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 uh, and different. 
Um, I showed this slide in in, uh, in New York, and they sort of said, "Wow, that's interesting. Those kangaroos really do run down the street." <laughs> uh, so, well, actually, in Canberra they do. Um, uh, it was quite a useful site because I got to explain the the um, Aboriginal Ten Embassy yes. too, and, um, and and that was helpful. Um, and our national parliament not being quite as grandiose as theirs um, or as old. Um, they do have Hicksville, though, in, in, in New York. This is an actual train station on the Long Island Railway. So, um, so when they, they describe, I describe Canberra as Hicksville, but they've actually got Hicksville. Um, but they are quite different, of course. Um, the population is much bigger. Um, the population density, particularly, is 37 times greater in New York than, uh, than in Canberra. So that, that has implications in terms of active transport and, and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, a lot more parks and open space uh, and cycleways in, in Canberra. The, the problem is not that we don't have them, it's the problem is that they're, that they're not used. Um, in New York, it's mostly because they don't have them, um, uh, but also they're not used for other reasons. Um, very different uh, space in terms of employment and also building infrastructure and so forth. So a lot of public buildings in, in, in Canberra, less so in New York, the, the opposite really private. Um, the public transport use in New York way, way higher than, than in, um, in Canberra. We have one of the lowest uses of public transport in the whole of Australia. Um, and car ownership, interestingly, so 3.8 times less in, in New York, or 3.8 times more in, in Canberra. Um, in terms of educational attainment, these uh, OECD figures on employment, income, housing, so forth, the mean's actually quite similar between um, uh, any of those measures between New York and Canberra, but the inequality measure is much uh, different, so very, very rich and very, very poor in New York, uh, more homogeneous in, in, um, in Canberra. Um, crime and security is an interesting thing when you start to look at policy synergy, something I'll, I'll touch on a bit later. Um, so if people are afraid to go outside at night because the lighting's not good, because people get shot, I um, actually went to one of the district public health offices for one of my, um, um, uh, one of my uh, meetings and um, I walked from the subway station and I said, why did you walk from the subway station? We had a, we had a, a, a ride-by shooting last week right out there on the cycleway. Um, someone on their bicycle shot someone. Kept going. So it was a different sort of place. Um, um, and the ethnic, ethnic diversity and, and inequity issues um, you know, much greater of an issue in, in New York uh, and Canberra. If you've ever seen any of the any of the uh, graphs of pretty much anything you want to name in New York, there's three areas that, that are, are bright red all the time. Harlem, uh, where Terry lives. Um, <laughs> well, it's East Harlem, really, but um, uh, East New York and the Bro and South Bronx. Um, higher crime, higher drugs, higher cardiovascular disease, higher cancer, um, uh, higher infant mortality, any, just name anything, um, it's there. Um, and, and so they have a, a much greater sort of emphasis on that, on that health equity aspect. Um, the food environment is um, similar and different. You can get good coffee in New York, but you have to make it yourself. Um, you can buy the coffee. Uh, there are contested spaces about, about what people, what a good diet should be. So pl plenty of paleo around the place. Um, chocolate is better with M and M's apparently. You can get any color. Um, but there are these um, fantastic fresh food markets that, and, and something that's really changed in the nutritional um, um, landscape in New York over recent times um, has been these, um, the more widespread um, various subsidies to allow them to happen and green cuts and so forth, particularly in those poor areas that I mentioned. Um, so the southern part of Manhattan has been transformed completely from the physical environment, the external physical environment. So, so there are cycleways everywhere. There are these cycle um, um, uh, uh, share programs and so forth. Um, they're expanding them into other parts of the city, but particularly in Manhattan. Uh, and the internal environment was, has been touched on earlier, but um, but some uh, some quite interesting effects of of some of the programs that I'll describe shortly that's gone on in the last twelve years. Um, uh, with health effects, and some of them being being led by health, but mostly not, mostly actually being led by other other components of the of the um, state of design uh, improvements. Um, so um, this one up here on the on the right hand side, that's the new school. It's the new new school, new building of the new school, which is about 150 years old. But um, the the the, the uh, obviously the um, 
the building is much newer than that. The, the staircase has become the architectural feature. So that uh, at night, it's just stunning to see the, the lights on the stairs. And not only has it become an architectural feature, it's also um, been re reconfigured as a meeting place. So it, it, it's a wide staircase and every mezzanine floor um, has a place with chairs and tables and people do meet there and they've done, done some sort of evaluation of that to, to say that the stairs have been used quite differently um, than a building that has a, a dark and dingy um, uh, fire escape, for example. Um, another element, my colleague uh, Karen Lee from, from New York Health Department uh, came up with this sign here. I'm not sure if you can see it from the back, but, um, but it's, it's um, save, cal save calories and electricity. Um, so um, burn, burn calories, uh, not electricity, take the stairs. And, and these have actually been now um, made compulsory in all government buildings to have a sign like this um, to, to at least have a, a prompt for people to, to use the stairs. And, and in most places also to make the stairs more prominent, at least, uh, at least you can find them. And the final one, this used to be a, a, um, a chiclet factory that's not Mills and Boone, chiclet is the, you know, the chewing gum and stuff. Um, <laughs> Here, so there used to be trains that used to go down the bottom there uh, through, and they'd load up from the from the making of the of the chewing gum um, product uh, from from the upper floors. And they've um, uh, it's this wonderful staircase. It's very difficult to find the lifts; they're right at the back. Um, so people come into the to the place. They use the stairs, and people use the stairs all day. And it's a it's a pleasant environment to, to use. Um, simple things, um, but very effective. So on the other hand, Canberra and, and, and New York are quite similar. So we both have this, we share this obesity problem about the same rate um, uh, and it's increasing. There's contested responses, um, there's recognised need for coordinated cross-agency policies and programs, but how to do it is the, is the challenge. Um, it's a city and a state government, so New York is bigger than I think um, uh, all but five of the states in the US in terms of population. So the, so the mayor and the city government has a lot of sway and a lot of scope to do stuff. Uh, and the ACT is a city and a state government together. Uh, and crucially, I think, so this is my second take-home take point, is the leadership and, uh, and political support for action. Um, I, I firmly believe that without that, you're actually stuffed. Um, so um, here are the aims of the Copy Candy study, is really to have a look at these two quite contrasting settings in many ways. Um, if we can find things of similarities between New York population of 20 million um, Canberra to a population of 300,000, 400,000. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a hell of a lot of cities, sorry, cities in between those two. Um, and so I think we can, we can learn, learn some things. It's really obesity as a case study of how you, how you um, look at cross-sectoral collaboration around a wicked problem. Um, in this case, obesity. Um, the method I've, I've used is a qualitative study with triangulation from other sources and the, the sample's been a, a wide cross-section of, of people who have been involved with these efforts over the last uh, little while. So for uh, New York it was the period 20, 2001 to 2013 which was the time of the Bloomberg um, administration <coughs> um, and in Canberra um, a shorter period. Uh, and so I'm not, not uh, reporting the Canberra stuff today but, but similar um, uh, a similar methodology has been used for, for Canberra colleagues by someone else, so it was inappropriate for me to do that uh, as I was sort of leading it. Um, these are the major themes that I explored. This was based on, on reading before I started the, started the, uh, the project. Um, uh, the, suggested that these were the main things we should be looking at in terms of collaborations of this nature, dealing with wicked problems. Uh, and so there was a, there was a semi-structured um, interview uh, schedule that I used um, relating to these themes. Uh, so the results. So we, I actually interviewed uh, uh, 41 people in 33 interviews with about 30 hours of, of tape. Um, people were extraordinarily open with their responses. Um, a wide range of people at different levels of the organisation. Uh, there was one state senator, um, someone from the mayor's office, quite a few people from outside of health within city, um, academic partners, um, the American Heart Foundation I also talked to. On, on the day when they, when, when one of the main pharmacies in the in the US stopped selling cigarettes, so <laughs> interesting. Uh, they're well behind in some ways, but um, they're well ahead on their obesity stuff. So a wide range of people, and, and a couple of people from the uh, design guidelines area. So an architect and a developer um, from the private industry, private private um, side. So the preliminary results. Um, the people that I, that I met were, in, uh, were very motivated for this work. They were incredibly innovative, they were um, natural collaborators. Um, they came, many came from a social equity, civil rights background, 
um, we're very interested in that component of the of the work. Uh, very contrasting experiences. Um, some came from a from a clinical, others from a community uh, background. So in one day in Brooklyn, I, I met with a pediatric cardiologist um, who had an evolutionary biology perspective on what was the problem with obesity. She'd been led to dealing with this issue because of um, two of her patients aged 12 who were grossly obese and died of cardiac failure. And she realised that, that something needed to be done outside of the hospital. Uh, and then she partnered with a, a woman who'd been an activist in South Africa during the apartheid time. And she talked me all about nutritional apartheid, which was something I hadn't heard of before. But, um, it was an interesting, her, her background was very much civil rights, um, that sort of perspective. She was a black American woman and, um, and they met in the middle and, and were working on in a community based um, approach to childhood obesity in, the Bron in Brooklyn. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, in terms of leadership, the, the, the key component um, uh, in, in New York was, uh, was Bloomberg. He was an ex extraordinary mayor for a, a range of reasons. Um, people called him the public health mayor and multiple uh, people that I interviewed mentioned that term. Um, but he didn't start like that. He actually started with a premise of trying to make New York uh, a, a nicer place to live and to attract the young people that were leaving to go to the hipster um, smaller towns in the, in the US, getting that, those innovative groups to come back to Manhattan. Um, remember there was a few issues that happened during this period. 9-11 was just before he started. Um, uh, the GFC happened, um, Cyclone Sandy or Hurricane Sandy happened, so there was a whole range of things that were disrupting life in New York and so his, his main premise was to try and get people back into the city, um, to have, make a more, a more livable city, um, sustainability was a big issue for the environmental perspective, so active transport was on the, on the agenda um, and health came later, now, health wasn't the major thing that was driving a lot of these things, um, even though it became uh, an important component as well. Um, he was also data driven, uh, as two, two people I interviewed said, in God we trust, all else bring data. Um, and, um, so, uh, and, and for him, he, he believed in data. So I think, again, unusually for, for a political person to be driven by quantitative data, I mean, he used to run the stock market and made billions, so he, he, knows, <laughs> he knows numbers, right? Um, so he, he had that. Um, uh, he, he didn't have any ambitions, he, he wanted to be mayor for as long as he could be mayor, but that was it. He didn't want to be president, he didn't want to be anything else. So he wasn't beholden to people as many other people in that sort of situation can be. Um, he just wanted the best for New York, that was what people told him. He then appointed smart commissioners to do, do stuff and to bring, bring ideas to him. Uh, and I think if they could convince him uh, with enough data to say, this is a problem, this is a way to fix it, and I can measure the effect. Um, he'd say, sure, go ahead. Um, and when he ran out of money from city funds, he often wrote his own cheque if he really liked it. Um, so, and those, those, those smart commissioners also, also de developed a whole bunch of um, people underneath them. And the, and the turnover is quite extraordinary in, these, uh, in, in New York City at the time. So in, of those 41 people that I interviewed, it's only six months ago, about a third of them have moved on to another job already. And, and um, several of them had moved before that as well from, from the Bloomberg period. So um, whilst they, they lose a bit in, in terms of, um, of uh, corporate memory, they also have a great ability to innovate um, when, when someone comes in. And crucially, Bloomberg was in for 12 years, so he kept together this group that had similar ideas and, and developed quite a lot, but it was 12 years. Um, the other thing that surprised me there was, um, in Canberra we spent a lot of time trying to get the governance right and make sure that people knew what they, what they needed to do to make sure there was a, a mechanism for reminding people what they should do, uh, a mechanism for measuring so that we could point out that they weren't doing what they were supposed to do, uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, in New York it was much looser. Um, so the coalition of the willing is really coalitions of the willing and it was quite loose most of the time, with some exceptions, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and bludgeoning persistence from the, from the mayor's office was, was one, of the, one of my better quotes for getting things done. Um, so, uh, Penny, I, I feel embarrassed to show a network diagram like this, but um, I, I would like to get you a, <laughs> like to get you a software at some stage. I think it would be really useful. Um, it is complex. Uh, I'm not going to go into the whole, whole thing here, and I don't expect you to, to memorise all of this, but it was my attempt to try and work out, work out what the hell was going on, because it wasn't a linear thing. It wasn't someone said something and the rest, rest of the people did it. Um, there was quite a discourse uh, in, the, in the press uh, and in the sort of um, 
the the the, the uh, accepted wisdom was that um, Bloomberg was a dictator. It was all top down. Um, that's why things failed. Um, and and he was quite crucial and central for a lot of lot of the things that happened. That's true. Um, but there was a, a great interplay, as I've described already, between the, the health commissioner and the other commissioners and the mayor. So they would come with their ideas. He'd say, "Go ahead." Um, the, the mayor did use um, uh, a number of non-legislative mechanisms, which were important, so it didn't have to take everything to the city council. Um, so the use of executive orders and this um, group called the uh, Board of Health, which is a, a group of experts that can make decisions uh, relatively quickly, um, was used. Uh, however, there were a whole bunch of other, other um, influences, so the courts overturned uh, quite a few of the things that, that were introduced. Uh, the media was sometimes supportive, often not supportive, um, the state and federal legislature was also a, a, a component, um, uh, and a very loose coalition between the sort of stuff that was happening in Department of Transport around roads, cycleways, um, active transport, uh, increasing pedestrian traffic and so forth. Um, uh, that was there, and, and um, it was possible for the health commissioner to every so often be a cheerleader for that and say, yeah, that's a great health effect, but that wasn't the, the driving force for the, for the Department of Transport work or the parks. Um, the one, the one, um, well, there were, there were a few exceptions to that. But the one I'll, I'll point out is the active design guidelines. So um, that came from an idea in, in uh, health, parks, um, Department of Transport, uh, the the planning department, uh, a whole range of uh, agencies across government and outside of government. Crucially, developers, architects, and so forth. Many of the people that I um, <coughs> managed to interview. Um, had a very prolonged um, working up of the active design guidelines and they're, they're an excellent piece of work and when you see them you can really tell the consultation that went on across sectors but also with the community uh, and there was a, a large amount of community consultation in relation to that so that was that was somewhat of the exception um, compared with for example the nutritional reforms which actually were more um, top down uh, the other thing that I, I was intrigued by was that it wasn't just an uh, individual, it wasn't just a population health approach. So there was population health approaches, so for example this um, pouring on the pounds um, uh, campaign, social marketing campaign, uh, really trying to influence it in a non-targeted way right across the city what people were, were having in terms of sh sugar sweetened beverages. But there were very individual approaches around exercise programs in parks and so forth. So when I went to New York, I was a bit of a purist to say, let's not get distracted by that individual stuff. Uh, let's concentrate on, on the other. Um, but now I'm a little bit, I can see the point that they were trying to make. And essentially starting a conversation, let's, let's get fitter, let's fix our nutrition, and there's various ways of doing that. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of these in great detail, but just to give you a range of, of, of um, a large number of these are the legislative and regulatory changes that were done by the New York um, uh, Department of Health mostly, but, but um, not just the Department of Health um, during this period. Um, I will talk about a couple of them, um, or, or maybe a couple of points. The first one is um, it took five years to get the first one done, and then there was a whole whole run over the next next period. The second point I make is. Um, um, the, the ones that were, that were most, the, the mo that caused the most controversy and actually um, the most press even internationally to hear were the ones around sh the sugar tax, the sugar sweetened beverage um, portion size um, restriction um, and the other one was um, uh, 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 right up, right up the, the, the top there, no sorry down the bottom here um, Around yeah, so the portion cap, the, the the sugar tax, and then restricting benefits um, uh, of of food uh, uh, allowing food supplement um, funding to be used on sugar sweet beverages. So those are the three that were the most controversial. They were all overturned in the courts, uh, or they were voted down in the state legislature in, in relation to the tax. So none of those actually happened. Now, if you talk to people outside of New York, actually even within New York, but outside of New York in, in the rest of the U.S who are on the nanny state, don't mess with my what I'm eating or drinking type of end of the political spectrum. They say, oh, those dreadful New Yorkers, they've introduced a sugar tax, they've introduced this, they've introduced that. Well, they haven't actually, didn't actually introduce any of them uh, uh, successfully. But they did change the, um, change the environment and change the conversation, and that was the, that was the crucial part. Um, similarly, with the, um, with the physical environment, 
Uh, it was a combination of carrots and sticks, so some of those design changes to the internal environment are actually, were actually about um, giving credits to um, in, in their, their environmental rating for, for, um, ha for um, housing stock and also for public buildings, um, which led to a, a, an increase in, in the ability for people to win tenders related to that score um, on the basis of their active design guideline um, recognition. Um, so money was important, political leadership and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and so forth I've, I've mentioned. Um, money came from a variety of sources. Some of it came as federal stimulus packages um, uh, to, to deal with, with obesity. Um, the, the barriers though were um, what I would call the, the, the coalition of the unwilling. So um, this term astroturfing, have people come across that? So that's false ground roots. Um, uh, so it, it, there were a number of instances that people told me about. Um, there was something, something called the South Bronx Korean Grocers Against Sugar Tax Society, Inc. Um, it, it was a front for Pepsi. Um, uh, the same sort of things that happened you know, with tobacco over the years when you, various, various grocery stores have come out with a, a very strong um, form letter and so forth that's usually written by British Tobacco. So uh, those things are, uh, were, were interesting. Um, there were some that were, that were uh, quite surprising for the people that were working. So the, the food security advocates and um, the National uh, Association for the Advancement of Coloured Peoples, um, uh, a big sort of big body for, for um, African American rights, um, both came out against those the, any, any restriction on the on the um, the food benefits uh, on the basis that it was racist, um, it was being bad for poor people, and so on. Um, there were these perceptions of, of nanny statism, and and the legal challenges weren't always successful, but often were. Um, in terms of public perceptions, the, the idea that change is the enemy rather than a specific change was a was a interesting thing. So as time went by, after a change came in, people kind of got used to it. Um, so something I knew, but it was something I could really see in those five or six years that many of those things had been embedded. Um, there was a definite weakness in, in influencing public perceptions uh, and including the public in the, in the discourse on some of those things, particularly around the nutritional changes. And as the previous commissioner has said to me, we lost the anecdote wars. So I think there's a project, you're doing a project depending on anecdotes and stories, aren't you, and, and narratives. So um, it's going to be a key one. Um, uh, that was something that they really recognised as a weakness. They had excellent quantitative data, but weak qualitative data. Uh, so when the Korean grocers came through, we're all going to, you know, we're all going to um, die or go out of business. There was no counter argument to that. There was a motive. Um, in terms of success, it was uh, surprisingly uh, contested. What people saw as success, uh, uh, some were very specific. Obviously, a change in the obesity rates. Other people saw, from their own programmatic expect, uh, perspective, that they had. Um, you know, X number of people um, in their program leading to Y, then that was a success. Whereas others were, were really holistic. So things like changing culture, changing uh, the conversation, changing the normal, those sort of things came through, um, particularly in relation to, to Hispanics um, and, and uh, that cultural component of, of, of obesity was fascinating to me. Um, so, a um, couple of slides on take-home messages. I think um, I've talked about the individual and population approach. Um, this idea of coalition, coalitions of the willing, so I'm getting to that my title of the talk now. Um, so, really engaging with professional groups, academics and others outside of government is absolutely crucial. Uh, and so there was always another voice um, to, to talk outside of government. And that, that is such a big place for everyone in this room that's not working for government. Um, it's really important that we've got, got people lined up that can come as a counterpoint to some of these really strong forces that are lined up against, against change. Um, having an effective communication, this is, um, uh, Andrew touched upon it earlier, is be being able to lead and change the conversation, being consistent, uh, complex, concrete, rational, sometimes emotional is, is required and, and those stories are really important. Um, don't underestimate the power of a well-evaluated pilot. So again, I went there thinking, we've got to scale up, we've got to scale up. Well, actually, you don't have to scale up everything immediately. Uh, it's good to have pilot programs and be able to demonstrate an effect which can lead to, to changes. And that's the work of the centre. Um, I think looking for a way to add health stories to non-health projects is a, is a way that they did it in New York, rather than saying it's all about health, health and all policies, um, for example, rather than say, well, you know, go for it. 
active transport, fantastic. All sorts of good environmental and other reasons to do that. Um, let's add a health story to it. So I'm working with the uh, the group that's in charge of the of the um, the, the light rail project in, in ACT at the moment to do exactly that, to come up with a health story which can support um, some of their mechanisms in the way that Billy was talking earlier, that the Heart Foundation has done previously. Um, I did go to Washington while I was there. There's the Capitol building. In the basement of the Capitol building, these are the pillars, <laughs> literally the pillars of democracy, right? I don't know if you can see it. Can anyone recognize the plants that are the motifs at the top of the, of the columns? This, the, the one here is very ancient. It was, one of, it was the only columns that weren't destroyed by the British in 1812 when they bombed the place. Um, uh, that's corn. Um, the other one's tobacco. Uh, so um, they're literally pinning up democracy. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we've got, got a ways to go. Um, so uh, to the centre and how, how it might work. The, the, that authoritative public voice I've talked about already. Um, uh, the, the systems approach that we've been talking about all day, in fact, is really important and, and, and gearing up our graduates. And it's great to see, I think, two or maybe three of the, of the, of the PhDs that have been funded are, are, in, that, are in that systems approach. Um, um, but I think you know, we're, if, if um, Simon's about to, about to uh, um, retire, you know, we need you guys as advocates uh, in the way that he has been so successful in the, in, and it's sometimes uncomfortable for academics, but, but I think it's very important in this space, in the obesity space, just as Simon has done over many years in tobacco. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I think that's, the, that's my last slide apart from acknowledgements, but I'll, I'll leave that up there to prompt discussion. Thank you.